Purse Strings offers an available for hire network of vetted professionals who specialize in serving women. When you have a life event that has suddenly made money a priority, you can now move forward with a whole new confidence that you're getting advice and services from savvy professionals who are uniquely equipped to serve your needs. Go to PurseStrings.co and use our directory of handpicked financial professionals when you're ready to plan for retirement, navigate divorce, buy your next home, fire up your new business, and more. Go to PurseStrings.co or check the link in the show notes. Now you can be financially fearless. Thank you, fearless listeners, and go you for hitting play. Please like and subscribe as it helps us grow. Also, share this with a friend as we have to keep talking about this shit. Now let's dive in. Coming up on today's edition of Women and Money, the shit we don't talk about, our guest is Donna Kendrick. We're so glad to have Donna on our podcast today. She's a certified financial professional with Sefton Financial. Donna also earned a certified divorce financial analyst certification. Donna focuses on serving widows. She knows all too well the pain of losing her husband as she used that experience to help women. Besides being a seasoned financial professional, Donna is also an author. The name of her book is A Guide to Widowhood and navigating the first three years. There's so much we want to learn about from Donna. So let's get started. Gloria Steinem once said, we will never solve the feminization of power until we solve the masculinity of wealth. Barbara Provost and Maggie Nielsen are the team at Purse Strings that will help you navigate the ins and outs of financial independence so that you can be financially fearless. This is Women in Money, the shit we don't talk about. Donna, it is so great to see you. Thank you for being on our podcast today. Lady, thank you so much. <laughs> of course, of course. I know your focus on widowhood is so important. I'm sure it's a topic people like to shy away from but we know it is so important to talk about. So we really want to bring this to light. Um, before we dig in, can you share a bit about who you are and what you do? Definitely. Um, God, how far back do you want me to go? I'll start with I'm from Philadelphia. So sometimes I talk fast. I will try <laughs> to slow it down for the podcast. <laughs> Ordinary is there. Um, but yeah, just a little bit of my background because I think that helps put it in perspective. So yeah, born and raised in Philadelphia. I was the daughter of a Philadelphia firefighter who married the son of a Philadelphia cop. We could say our dad set us up on a blind date, but that sounds like we were both pathetic and couldn't get dates, but we could. <laughs> we just really liked one Clarify another. Clarify that. <laughs> yeah, let's let's just, I know I was in my 20s, but I'm going back. Um, but no, so when I was getting married, he worked for Homeland Security. Um, we lived abroad. He was with the US Embassy in Rome. Um, so I actually gave up my career probably after my first two kids were born to follow him abroad. Um, so it's almost like a military life back and forth. We wound up having three kids during that whole time um, and then came back stateside in 2011. Um, 2013, we got positioned again in the Philadelphia area, like back home after being gone for like seven years. It was lovely. Um, and two months after we got back here, he passed away. And my kids were eight, 11 and 12. And I was like, crap. Like I gave up my career. I was working part-time at the schools. I had just taught English to Italian kids. They all say water, W-A-R-D-E-R for Philadelphia listeners. Um, but that's <laughs> what I was doing. Like how am I going to support these kids? And I kind of took two years and just stayed at that part-time job so I could follow my kids' schedules. See, I think they were learning how to speak English in school. They were learning um, a brand new neighborhood. I was really lucky and blessed though, because my sister was in the school district that I moved into, and we were finally back close to family, where we had been gone for so long. So even though this major change was going on, when the changes, it was like I had the support of my family, as well as this new community. This community we moved into was just wonderful. They scooped us up, and they took care of us, and always have been. So very thankful there. Um, but two years later, it was like, all right, I know I have to go back to work, like big girl work, Big girl money. What am I going to do? I was educated. I was smart. I had experience. Um, and it's come on one of those things when life gives you lemons. What are you going to do? I was like, what? What lemonade are we going to make out of this? And I really reflected back on 
after the experience of losing Greg, what was the most impactful thing for me? And it was truly the relationship with the new financial advisor that I had found after Greg passed and transitioned over to. Greg and I had a financial advisor in our young 20s. That's what got us the life insurance that covered our butts. My kid was able to keep my, my house, put my kids into school. And I realized that what I wanted to do was give that type of support and service to the widow community, to those families in transition, to bring a little love, patience, and hand-holding into that financial um, spectrum and figured out how to do it. Went back to school, got all my license, studied for the CFP, mentored under that advisor, um, and then ultimately in 2020 hung my own shingle. Sefton is my maiden name, um, and that's tribute to my dad, who worked as a janitor in exchange for our private school tuition for years. So he gets the name. That's all. Then there's my story. Is that good perspective? <sighs> That's got a lot. <laughs> I know I have goosebumps too. There's a lot in there to unpack a little bit. So, wow. Can we start by sharing your experience of first becoming a widow? I mean, how shocking that must have been for you. It was. It was um, a sudden loss and uh, he had taken his own life and we were just floored um, emotionally, like trying to make your kids okay feeling good as a woman after that happens. Like, I can't tell you I dated well in the first five years. Wah, wah, didn't go well. <laughs> right? Yikes. Just, we're going to erase that, but now the listeners know too much. I am now remarried and he's wonderful and I awesome. appreciate him more due to those bad experiences. And by the way, he knew me during that time, so he saw me through those bad experiences. Oh, so wow. he, it's often a joke. I'm like, can we leave it? Can we just leave it where it's at? Wow, wow. Um, but no, let's go back to those days. And they were hard. And you don't know which end is up. And you're trying to make everyday decisions. Um, you're trying to figure out where where your role in the finances were, right? Like I knew I knew where everything was. Um, I didn't know how to access his benefits with the government. I didn't know when life insurance was going to pay out. I didn't know how he had his 401k invested. I knew how much we put in. And we had a very open relationship about our finances. I never went to ask, like, are you a target date fund? I found out that he was, he's very risk averse. We used to make fun of my late husband. We used to call him beige man because everything <laughs> was starched and beige. Like, I mean, you knew where the man stood and that was it. So he was scared of the ups and downs in the market. And when 2008 come, he he went to, to safety, like, quote unquote, he went to fixed income and was never back into the marketplace. I didn't know that till after he died. We had mm -hmm. missed all those years of the market on an upswing because we weren't exposed to those asset classes. So here I am, someone who's in charge of the family finances. We knew how much we were putting into the 401k and I never made that next decision. I never had that next question. How are we invested? How often do you look at it? Those are those things that all of a sudden you were uncovering, which would be something to digest for any one of us, but mm -hmm. try digesting it when you're worried you're going to run out of money, mm -hmm. right? When we had just moved into a new house because we moved back to the Philadelphia area, if you remember in the story, mm -hmm. we were there for two months. So we had spent our cash reserve on the mm -hmm. deposit for the house. So here comes life on credit cards. Like you would not think you're going to be in that situation waiting to in line to apply for social security, literally on a gray day, snowy, yucky. Like that's that feeling I had of complete desperation and loss. It was hard. And trying to find a new financial advisor when you felt like that was tough too. I was a tough client. I walked around with a big tote bag full of all of my things, like my life insurance and my my birth certificates. And I didn't know who needed what. So I was just going to carry it around with me. And I felt like I was doing a good job protecting myself, right? Yeah. No, not smart. Walking around Philadelphia with social security cards and birth certificates, not smart. But I was waiting. I was waiting for that financial advisor to click. The one that I, I knew was going to let me slide that tote bag over was going to take care of me. And I was going yeah. to go take care of my kids. Tell me what you need. Let me make the decisions I have to. And let's hold off on anything else. And I found the person. So part of what I wrote in my book is that journey, right? Like, how do you interview someone? How do you use these people that are like, what can I do to help you? That community, right? That's trying to do good things. Oh, can you call these financial advisors and ask the top five questions to them? Let me know how they sound. Like, no, yeah. no one does that, but it would be really helpful. And that's what we wrote in the book. Like, from my journey, what do I wish would have happened that yeah. didn't? And trying to put a roadmap out there for these 
women making financial decisions and numbness and know their barriers of what do you have to make? What do you not? And how to find the right person. Yeah. Also, I had a hard time with protecting my privacy of information from my friends and my family because you're gutted. Right. And you're, mm. they're asking how they help. And sometimes you tell them too much, right. Mm. Or sometimes you don't tell them enough and now they worry about you. Mm-hmm. And that's a hard one to balance and it sticks with you moving forward. Yeah. Wow. So, so you did mention that you had a financial professional early on in your marriage, but are you saying that you found somebody else to do work with because, because why? Yeah. Um, he was, I just recorded a podcast on it, right? Like I had a great relationship with the guy, right? Like um, he was lovely. He really helped us when we were younger. We had um, a nice nest egg to invest when we went abroad um, and he did a good job with it. Plus he got us this, the insurance that saved me. Yeah, Thank right? the Lord. Yeah. yeah, yep. And I remember when I called him about the insurance, of course he was not expecting that call. Like, you know, 42 year old Greg's dead. I need to cash in the life insurance. Can you help me? Like I should have given him a little leeway. <laughs> like I should have given him a little bit of a pause. I did not. I was miss action taker. And I'm going to get this all squared away in two weeks. So I can just go sit and cry in my bedroom. Like, let's go. But I had realized when I was talking to him that he had moved his practice away from general families and helping small businesses into succession. Great for him. He'd be perfect for it, right? He came from a family of small businesses. And I was excited for him, but that's when the light bulb went off. Like, woo wee. I need someone who's going to hold my hand. Mm -hmm. Um, And he probably would have. And I probably would have felt guilty taking him away from what he loved to do. Um, And I knew that. So to this day, I think I could call him and say, hi, I've had lunch with him since then, right? Like no hard feelings. Um, But I did find somebody that was a perfect fit. And I, I really love how you did go and find somebody else as they did nothing wrong, but you knew you needed someone who had that specialties and that expertise. And, you know, this is something I was thinking about before our conversation of, They always say, you know, in the first year, don't make any big decisions. I know you need to cash in this life insurance policy. So you need to turn to someone because I have no idea how to do that. But then finding a new financial professional in the midst of all of this does sound like a lot of work, but it sounded like that's the necessary, you needed to build that necessary team um, that you didn't need before. And so that change was really um, necessary for then you to thrive. Yeah, 100%. And it made me feel better to leave that tote bag and be like, yours now, right? It freed me up for so much more. Um, there is literally, I think, oh, I think probably about $5,000 of paper savings bonds in there. And I remember the admin looking at me like, oh no, I'm like, Excel spreadsheet, have a good day. <laughs> <laughs> the poor thing, the poor thing. Um, but yeah, like I had to, and and I'll, I'll back up for the listeners. How did I find this advisor? Um, yeah. Word of mouth. Right. So I asked a lot of the people I was working as a teaching assistant in the school. I had asked a lot of the people I respected in the school, like, hey, who do you use? Who did your mom use when her when your dad passed? Right. That's always started the interview process. And then finally, I actually went kind of back into my own experience. So it was the gentleman who played the bagpipes at my wedding to Greg. He had passed away and I knew about it. And I reached out to his widow through mutual friends. And said, who did you use? Were you happy? That's the advisor I went with. So I knew it was someone who had the experience. I knew, I saw the outcome. She was good. She had four kids, right? Good is on the surface, right? She was good in my book. She was standing upright and her kids looked happy. That was good. That was my threshold. Um, But I say that to a lot of people out there, like to to people looking for advisors, like, no, no, ask your trusted resources. Ask the people you know, ask people with similar life situations. You might be floored to find out they have always had one or they've never had, right? Like open up that discussion. You don't have to give them all your balances. You're asking for a referral. We all love to talk about the good things we do. We also like to talk about things we don't do well. So make sure that you're asking the right questions and the right people. Wow. That's that's great advice Um, that you didn't just, I love that you didn't just grab the next person. Like, Oh, my brother-in-law X can help you. You know, you really did your own due diligence because you knew you needed somebody special to help you during that time. Good for you. Um, And with all this experience, tell us a little bit about what prompted you to write your book. And I know you also have a workbook because I have given those away to people that were in your situation. So tell us a little bit about that whole experience. 
Yeah. Um, so like here comes 2020, right? <laughs> and the world comes to a screeching halt. Um, I am remarried now. We are a blended family and we quote unquote moved in together two weeks before the shutdown. So all of a sudden we've got six kids, three and three, who have never lived together, learning how to live together. And it was like, what are we going to do? Right. Well, that's why I hung my own shingle because I moved my office to five minutes from the house. So I was commuting 45 minutes to an hour um, to my job before then. And I knew those kids were going to be home for a long time. So that allowed me to balance being a mommy and continuing as a financial advisor in my own practice. Um, and I was scared. Like who launches their own business in the middle of a pandemic? Right. Like, <laughs> wow. I did, right? Because <laughs> look what else has happened, right? Like it can only go up from here. Right. Um, and after a year, I'm like, oh my God, like it worked. Like I really got some clients that needed that listening ear during the pandemic who had lost spouses or or loved ones. And they felt even more out of control than I did because they're by themselves. Right. Yeah. I had a whole community taking care of me. I had people dropping off meals. I wasn't separated from everyone. So I realized that there was such a need and there was such a need when you talked about too, like someone that said, oh, my brother in law is savvy in this. Like, let's go. So many of those widows thought the financial planning services were closed down. Many mm -hmm. of them were right during mm -hmm. COVID. Yeah. So they made decisions on their own and they made their decisions with Uncle Bobby. Yeah. Um, and so when I actually was introduced to them, we had to unwind some of those decisions um, or find new solutions because we missed opportunities. And so I really sat there and was like, okay, wait, after one year of doing this specifically in that niche market for widows and families in transition, I've missed the boat because I couldn't catch them early enough so they didn't misstep or get misguided. So how do I get there sooner? And that's where the idea for the book came. So if I can put the book out there, if I can educate people and it can be something that you share, like, oh, I heard your mom died. Can you give this to your dad? Right, it's helpful. Or read, be that person, that, that eager person to help read the pages and be like, hey, I highlighted these, just read those for right now. Like how to find a financial advisor, how to pull together your net worth. Right? The widow or widower might need that activity to stay busy. So really big, backing up, that's how I had the idea for the book, was how do I get the educational pieces out there? How do I empower these widow and widowers when they are just spinning to know I can slow the roll, right? Like I don't have to make all the decisions right now, but which ones do I have to make? And what the heck happens with social security? Like let's answer some of those questions. There's a big glossary in the back too of all these financial definitions, right? Like I can say the word RMD off the top of my lips. I think everyone knows what it means. No, they don't, right? Like that's, that's where we need that education. And, uh, and I'm someone who doesn't like to be vulnerable. So if I was having a conversation with a financial advisor and they said RMD, guaranteed I'd pick up that book and I'd look at what an <laughs> RMD was and be like, yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I close that. Yeah. That's really why I started to work the book. And, and my husband was just so supportive of it um, with the idea. A lot of it was waking up at four in the morning, writing from four to six and then going to work, right? Uh, taking weekends and just sitting in the quiet and writing all that I could. I'm a statistician by education. I am not a writer. My sister got those genes, right? But I, I found the who, not how. I found the content editors to help my message come out. And yeah, they're going to take your book and cut it in half and tell you to rewrite some. You just do it, right? Because they knew it was important that that book got out there. I think that's wonderful. And I'm so glad that book has gotten around. And I know we have a copy and just, you know, when no one plans widowhood. And so knowing that, you know, a friend has that resource or just hearing this podcast and knowing like, if this were ever to happen, I can just turn to Donna and know that, you know, you're in our pocket, you're in our corner is so, so helpful. What kind of advice do you give towards widows in that first year? Um, I know a lot of times we hear, you know, don't do anything, but I know you can't just not do anything. Um, so what advice, you know, would you give at the beginning stages? Yeah. Um, the first one, gather your documents. Talk about that little tote bag, right? Did I say it was an organized tote bag? No, but it's a tote bag full of what I thought was important. Um, and that really is important. There are some strategic items that have to be actioned many of times. And many of times you don't know your full financial picture if that spouse that you lost or that partner was the lead in the home finances. Mm -hmm. You might not even know where that is, right? You might not have the passwords to log in, right? So even though you want to curl up in the ball many of days when you're in widowhood, you've got to get up 
And you really have to start organizing. If you have a trusted resource, I picked one person that I was really trusting through all of this. Like, tell them this is what you need. Guarantee. Most likely, they're going to be like, hell yes, let's go. Right. So first one, organize your documents to just get a general understanding of what it costs to be you. Right. So if that means that you weren't the lead at the house um, and managing the finances, we'll pull up some old credit card bills. Right. Pull up your taxes and just get a general idea of what it costs you to be you. Get the help that you need emotionally so you can know when it's time to make decisions, when it's time to realize you're avoiding decisions and when when you can just be. Right. And I tried to be brave. Right. Like I was like, now nah, my never matter. Right. Like I'm good. And I was, I ran for the first year. Like I wanted the award winning best widow out there. Right. Like, <laughs> well, you're an A plus 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 personality, of course. Right. And when people, when I hear people be like, oh, how's your sister in law done? I wanted, I wanted the, the response to be like, oh, she's doing awesome. We're so proud of her. Winning again. Right. Here comes year two, screeching halt. Oh, I was floored. All those great decisions I made, some of them were too quick. I was lucky I had the financial advisor said, okay, we'll put that there because we can do that next year. Like he was smart. Like he knew me more than I knew me. Um, so really thankful for that. But I had to go and I had to get the the counseling, um, the the emotional freedom technique really helped me um, just to be able to slow the roll of all the decision makings and worries that, is that a word, decision makings? Oh, <laughs> decision making and worry that, I had in the back of my head to be able to clear some space to know, like, I got to be a big girl and keep managing these finances, right? And I can't spend and spoil the kids too much because we might need those dollars for food, education, retirement, right? Like, I had to find that balance. And until I got that help in year two, I wasn't doing a good job. I love that. Those are great tips. Um, yeah. And we always need to make sure we're protecting our mental health as well and getting people to support us there as well, for sure big part. And when you can do that and free up the space, you will make better decisions, right? The best decisions I have is really when my financial advisor said, you're going to be okay. Like if you want to do X, well, this is what we need to save and this is what we need to spend. If you want to do Y, you got to get back to work, right? And if you want to do O in the middle, well, that's okay. Take some time because we have a cash reserve set aside. And with social security for the kids, you can float it for a little bit of time. Like I was made able to make better decisions when someone said that to me. When someone answered, are you going to be okay? And the answer was, well, yeah, with options, right? And with uh, parameters, but I was able to make better decisions when I heard that. So yeah, it's like a huge sigh of relief. Yeah, that. that's what people want to hear, right? That's why they work with their financial advisors so they can walk through and, and plan. And, you know, you, a couple of things you said about getting your documents in order. At Purse Strings, we are always wanting women to get ahead of the game on these things. So we have a, a fine family emergency binder where they can collect all of this information and get it documented so that they don't have to scramble last minute. We've heard so many horror stories about people rummaging through old desks to find policies and, you know, making tons of phone calls to find accounts. And so on that behalf, we put together this emergency binder and we can put a link to it in the show notes. Also, where's my money going? Like you said, how much does it cost to be you? That's another resource that we have where people can kind of sit down and, and figure out what what's my cash flow every month, what's coming in, what's going out. So we do also have those resources at Purse Strings as well. And I'm sure, Donna, you have those resources as well for your clients too to get started. But I do agree that we see those two activities as being the most fundamental at any time of you know, financial concern. Yeah. So, and I love your document. I have seen it. And I, I wanted to put a big sticker on top that said, don't wait for widowhood, do it now. Yeah. So feel free, tagline that. But it's true, right? Yeah. Like I was lucky I led most of the family finances. And if not, then sit with your partner and do that binder, right? Yeah. Know where the key to the safe deposit box is, right? If I would have done that with Greg, I would have known that we weren't invested well. We weren't, no, wait, we were invested. Just we didn't have our asset allocation well. That's right? right. And it probably been a little bit of a discussion, but with that discussion, we would have learned more about one another and what we both had as an expectation for retirement. We didn't have that. Right. So I love that. I've seen your binder. Do it, do it, do it. Don't wait for widowhood. Do it, do it, do it. Thank you. 
And so are there any like common mistakes you see women make through widowhood that you want to make sure are brought to our attention or hopefully prevented? Yeah. Um, well, we'll stick with the one emotional one, right? Like sometimes it's easy to buy something, right? Because you've lost something intangible. So yeah. it's easy to replace with something tangible. Or if you've lived before with debt, right? Outside of just the regular mortgage. And sometimes life insurance comes in or employer benefits. And all of a sudden you have a chunk of money that you've never had before. And we all race to say, pay off the debt. I want to feel whole because life feels so out of control. That's where I say stop, right? We might have other solutions for that. Maybe all that debt isn't yours, right? Or maybe you need some of that money to go towards retirement. Or in my case, I needed some money to go back to school. So I could launch into a bigger career moving forward and be able to add more value to other people's lives. I didn't just want a nine to five job. I wanted to add value. I need to make, we're going to cry. <laughs> I need to add value for two people. You would have added so much positivity and greatness to this world. So I had to do better for two. And so I did go back to school and I did create a job a career for myself that could add that value. And if I would have raced to pay off debt with that money instead of educating myself, wow, wow. The debt came off a few years later. It was manageable. It was okay. So those are two big things. It's like I love to see people avoid. The other, yeah, the other thing I, I see a lot of widows do is race into other relationships. Mm-hmm. And financially support those relationships because sometimes you do have new streams of income that you didn't have before. And even though you hate to say it, that might be the attractive part for the other person in the relationship. Mm. So I beg of everyone to know your value, slow your role, and enjoy it. If it's meant to be, it will be here. And remember your soul each and every day. That's beautiful. It's such, such great advice. Um I, I get that where people really want to either buy something or pay off debt, but I love how you took pause. You got expert advice. You set yourself up for success by going back to school. And you don't have a career, Donna. You have a mission. I mean, you have lived this experience that now you can share and guide other women through what you experienced, but they'll come out whole and healthy at the other end just by learning from you. So I appreciate all that you do. And wow, so many women are going to benefit from the work that you do. Thank you for that. I always say too, if each day I change one person's life in one little way, well, it was a good day, right? It was a good day. So. Yeah. Well, this has been such a a wonderful sharing of information, of your story, of all that you have to offer which is so impactful. And I just, you gave me goosebumps and I just appreciate your vulnerability to come in and, and share your story. We so appreciate it. Well, thank you for opening the doors and for hosting the podcast and for making such a good family binder. So good. <laughs> it's so good. Please use it. Everyone listening. Thank you. Yeah, this, this has been wonderful. Is there, is there anything else, um, any parting thoughts you want to share today with our listeners? I might always just say too, like, love the past and love the future. Like every day when we wake up, we have a brand new opportunity to do it right. Don't beat yourself up. Don't hang on to it. Like whatever you did in the past, right, wrong, and different, it got you to where you are right now. Have the new opportunity. So I love when people and women can have a little bit of forgiveness for themselves and do that. I love it. Yeah. So thank you again, Donna, for coming on today. Um, if anyone wants to grab Donna's book, it will definitely be in the show notes. Um, as well. So you can get that a guide to widowhood navigating the first three years. Um, and we want to thank everyone for listening today. Please share this message, subscribe and be financially fearless. Have a great day. Information is for illustrative purposes only and does not constitute tax, investment, or legal advice. Always consult with a qualified investment, legal, or tax professional before taking any action. Purse Strings offers an available-for-hire network of vetted professionals who specialize in serving women. 
When you have a life event that has suddenly made money a priority, you can now move forward with a whole new confidence that you're getting advice and services from savvy professionals who are uniquely equipped to serve your needs. Go to pursestrings.co and use our directory of handpicked financial professionals when you're ready to plan for retirement, navigate divorce, buy your next home, fire up your new business, and more. Go to pursestrings.co or check the link in the show notes. Now you can be financially fearless.